Greetings, everyone. Before undertaking the writing of our own textbook series, we want to first create a syllabus incorporating what is, in our opinion, an excellent book for learning how to listen intelligently to music. What to Listen for in Music, first edition published in 1939, the author, Aaron Copland, was an established and internationally successful composer in his own time. Finding an early edition of this book in my father's library, I recall reading through it as a teenager. This planted seeds of wanting to become a composer, though the seeds lay dormant for decades due to circumstances and lack of encouragement. I would reflect back on what the author had to say about the inner workings of Concerto Grosso, Fugue, about symphonic development, tone poems, and light motifs, and many works of celebrated composers. There is a reference to this book in the description box, along with a list of other works consulted. I suggest that students obtain and read through Copland's book. So without further delay, let's delve into what is presently a very much Copland-influenced essay on music appreciation and contexts. The main highlights will discuss how to listen to music and why, also the various contexts nurturing real-world music creators, their environment, the where, when, who, and what. Attending a course on the appreciation of music and its contexts is of little value to us unless we also do a lot of actual listening to the music we're studying. Music is much more accessible today with the advent of various audio and visual media, from tapes to discs to digital storage devices to internet video sites as well as movies, video games, and television. It is actually difficult to avoid hearing music these days. As far as possible, we will provide links and references to online and recorded performances of the music we examine. But bear in mind that links may eventually change or expire. Aaron Copland wrote that, even though we may object that we don't understand music, yet we never say that about a book we might have read, if you read and come to understand a great work of art literature, say, Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, even though you are not yourself a writer, then even if you are not a musician, you can learn to listen to and appreciate a complex piece of concert music. Do not underestimate the ability of your ear-brain processing center to understand the music you hear in this course. Perfect pitch is not required. To be able to recognize the note A when you hear it may, at times, be helpful, but certainly does not prove, taken by itself, that you are a musical person. It has only a limited significance in relationship to the real understanding of music which concerns us here. And you don't have to be able to sit down at a piano keyboard and play a song after hearing it only one time. Minimum prerequisite. The ability to recognize a melody that you have heard before when you hear it again. For example, this well-known public domain tune Why is this ability to remember a melody so important? Because melodies are like the plot, events, and characters of a novel. Someone who cannot recognize a melody when hearing it is like someone who cannot follow the unfolding events of a story. Here is a melodic recognition test. You will hear three different public domain tunes. Which of the three tunes did you just hear played in the previous slide? Melody A, Melody B or Melody C. If you said Melody C, which was the song Go Tell Aunt Rhody, you are correct. Now, being a DJ or musician, i.e. someone who can play tunes on a musical instrument, does not prove musical intelligence. Many can play musical instruments, or DJ, but do not care to know much about the science of music. Perhaps they have another agenda. 
In this course, what we do for you, the listener, is call attention to milestones in the music itself and context. But to benefit from the analyses, you will have to spend time doing personal listening to the assigned music. There are no shortcuts or substitutes for the mental workout. Repeated hearings of the same musical works have proven helpful in developing the ability to recognize melody. The benefits accrue over time. Think of the Christmas music which we are bombarded with every holiday season. You recognize the songs because you've heard them over and over again. This is also similar to the way we learn to speak. We hear words and sentences repeated over and over in our environment and received positive feedback from parents, relatives, friends, and neighbors. Music is not produced in a vacuum. There are always historical, geographical, cultural, and personal contexts the environment to be considered. Ludwig van Beethoven, even today one of the most famous and influential composers, was born in Bonn, Germany, and spent most of his life in Germany or neighboring countries in Europe. His father, Joseph, or Josef, a musician, started young Ludwig studying music his father was also an alcoholic. Beethoven lived during a specific time in history. He was born in 1770 and died in 1827, and as a result was immersed in the social, political, religious, and economic realities of his day. The intellectual and philosophical movement known as the Enlightenment dominated Europe. the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte all occurred during Beethoven's lifetime. Beethoven had planned for a career as a performing musician. He was a concert pianist, but began losing his hearing during his late twenties. Beethoven had become completely deaf by the time he wrote many of his famous masterpieces. That last melody, known as Ode to Joy, is heard in the finale of his Ninth Symphony. Composed for large symphony orchestra and mixed chorus, Beethoven, who was present at the inaugural performance of this symphony, could hear nothing except what was inside his head. All the aforementioned contexts, the historical, geographical, cultural, and personal circumstances, had an influence on Beethoven's music. Hypothetical question. Would it have sounded the same if the composer had grown up in another land, say, in Asia, or on an island in the middle of the ocean, such as Fiji or Zanzibar, or at a different time, say, 4,500 years ago? What type of music would Beethoven come up with, for example, had he grown up in ancient Egypt? Or suppose Beethoven was living today with electronic devices such as hearing aids, or perhaps in the future, where there might be a cure for his hearing handicap. Would such changed circumstances, different contexts, have an impact on the composer's personality, on his music? Such are some of the contexts we want to bear in mind while analyzing and learning to appreciate the various types and styles of music we examine. Welcome once more, and keep listening. If you like this presentation, please share, pose questions in a comment, and subscribe to the channel for updates. Thank you for watching.